Take your Bibles this morning and turn to 1 Timothy chapter 3, please. 1 Timothy chapter 3. If you've been around Calvary Baptist Church for very long, you've heard me say, I wish God would have included a church constitution. It would be nice to know exactly how God would have us conduct business as his local assembly of believers. Now, if you look at our church constitution, there are three parts to it. There's the articles of faith, there's the church covenant, and then there's the bylaws. And as I started to think about that, you know, God has given to us two-thirds of that document. He's given to us our articles of faith. He has given to us his word so that we would know what we are to believe and how we are to live that out in this world. That's a good thing. He's also given to us covenant, how we are to live together as a body of believers. All you have to do is study the one and others of Scripture, how we are to relate with each other and how we are to interact with each other and how we are to share with it within the body. It's that bylaw section that sometimes really becomes sticky. Because the bylaws tell us how we operate as a church. Over more than 45 years of ministry, I have talked to a lot of people who have left churches. Very few of them have left because the church changed what they believed. Very few of them left churches because of the interaction that was taking place within the body, the church covenant. Many left churches because they didn't like the way it was being operated. They didn't like the way things were getting done. They didn't like how the pastor was pastoring or the deacons were deaking. And it was that tension that caused folks to leave one assembly of believers and, and go to another. Now in the pastoral epistles, Paul is identified, has identified two young pastors, Timothy and Titus. Young guys who are trying to do ministry within a local assembly of believers. And so he writes to them and helps them understand what it is to operate within a local assembly of believers. Bylaws in many ways. As we have studied 1 Timothy... We have discovered that the first thing Paul does with Timothy is he warns them about false teachers. As we gather together as an assembly of believers, as we operate, we need to beware of false teachers who would get in and change our articles of faith or would change our church covenant so that we'd no longer be able to focus on what God has given to us in truth. He reminds young Timothy that he needs to focus on the gospel. Any church that loses sight of the gospel has lost sight of God. Because the gospel is God working in us and through us to be salt and light in this world. We've talked a lot recently about being the church of God. And that could be summed up in the gospel. And then Paul says, Timothy, never forget to pray. And after you've prayed, remember to pray. And after you've remembered to pray, pray some more. Prayer is so, so necessary within a body of believers. And Paul identifies those truths as he encourages Timothy to operate within the body of believers that he has been called to. We now move to chapter 3. And Paul tells Timothy that there are two offices that are necessary to help a local assembly of believers function well within the body of Christ. And these offices are given to bodies to help them fulfill what God has called them to do. The first office is that of pastor. And in the first Seven verses of 1 Timothy chapter 3. Paul tells Timothy that overseers, bishops, pastors, elders 
have certain qualifications that they need to fulfill if they're going to be effective within a local body of believers. I want you to look at the screen this morning. Pastor John and Preston and I took some time last week to read this passage of Scripture. You listen to what God has to say about overseers. 1 Timothy 3, 1 to 7. This saying is trustworthy. If anyone desires the office of an overseer, he desires a noble task. Therefore, an overseer must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, sober-minded, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, and able to teach. Not a drunkard, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must manage his own household well, with all dignity, keeping his children submissive. For if someone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he care for God's church? He must not be a recent convert, or he may become puffed up with conceit and fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must be well thought of by outsiders, so that he may not fall into disgrace, into the snare of the devil. 1 Timothy 3. 1 to 7. Paul reminds Timothy that if he's going to be a shepherd, if he is going to lead the church of Jesus Christ, there are qualifications that are necessary to be evidenced in his life. We now move to verse 8. And in verse 8, Paul talks about deacons. He uses the word likewise deacons and there are certain qualifications that deacons must fulfill must live out in their lives if they're going to be qualified to lead the church of God last Tuesday night was our deacons meeting and I pulled our men together and I said okay guys I want you to read this passage of scripture for me so you follow along please as our deacons read for us beginning with verse 8 Deacons? 1 Timothy 3, 8-13. Deacons likewise must be dignified, not double-tongued, not addicted to too much wine, not greedy for dishonest gain. They must hold the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience. And let them also be tested first. Then let them serve as deacons if they prove themselves blameless. Their wives likewise must be dignified, not slanders, but sober-minded, faithful in all things. Let the deacons each be the husband of one wife, managing their children and their own household well. For those who serve well as deacons gain a good standing for themselves, and also great confidence in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. 1 Timothy 3, verses 8 through 13. Aren't they a great looking group of guys? Now, I hope you weren't distracted by two things. You saw that our deacons, two of them, were wearing Michigan shirts. I hope that wasn't a problem. It, it just shows that we can all blend our lives together because we're brothers in Christ. And our deacons don't know what to do with themselves sometimes when they're on camera. But what I want you to notice most of all is that there are qualifications for our deacons that are necessary if they are going to fulfill the role that God has called them to do. Now, as you listen to that text, did you pick up the musts? Seven times in 13 verses, Paul says to Timothy, these are qualifications that are non-negotiable. The pastor must, the overseer must, the leader must, the deacons must. Underline those in your text, will you please? It is imperative that leadership fulfill God's qualifications if they're going to be effective in leadership. The other thing that I want you to notice is the word likewise. You find that in verse 8. I want you to note that deacons and pastors' qualifications in many ways are woven together. And as Paul writes about the deacons, he says, yeah, deacons, likewise, just like the shepherd, just like the bishop, just like the overseer. 
These qualities are necessary in your life. Now, the one quality, and we studied this before, that is different between overseer and deacon is apt to teach. That's the one quality that is exclusive to, to pastors, to elders, to bishops, to, to overseers. Now, very quickly this morning, I want to identify four areas that are non-negotiable in the overseers, the pastors, the bishops, the elders' lives, and the deacons' lives. And we're not going to take a lot of time to study each of these areas individually, so I'm going to leave that to you. Please take the time, even as we are looking forward to nominations for 2021, to, to study these qualities. But let me give them to you. First of all, it begins with personal character. And it is so important, as identified in our text, that the deacons as well as the pastors be, number one, above reproach, and number two, that they be blameless. Now, that does not mean that they are perfect. But what it does mean is that when there are difficulties in their lives, they know how to deal with it. You've heard me say it's always your turn. And many times in the lives of leadership, you have to take the time to go and reclaim relationships. Now, Paul uses terms like sober-minded, self-control, respectable, not double-tongued, not addicted to wine, dignified, um, hospitable, not greedy of filthy lucre, not greedy of money, to, to identify these two areas in, in personal character. That's where it begins. But not only is there a personal character issue, there's also a spiritual issue. And it's very important that we understand that these are spiritual offices. These are not offices that are given because you've been around a long time or you've fulfilled some kind of attendance requirement. These are spiritual offices. And as we look at these spiritual offices, we recognize that Paul identifies them as not a recent convert, that they hold the faith in a clear conscience and that they be tested. You see, it's real easy as a pastor or deacon to be puffed up, to be proud. And you have to guard about that. And sometimes it's real easy to not be proven. Somebody is doing a great job and, and they've not had the, the ability to prove themselves in, in the ministry. But that's so necessary in a spiritual character of our leaders. We also discover that there is a moral purity that is so, so necessary in the lives of bishops, overseers, pastors, elders, deacons, and, and we must recognize that. And that moral purity has to do with marital relationships. In the text, for the overseer, for the bishop, and for the deacons, it says, husband of one wife. Now, now this is not marital status. But what this is, is faithfulness in marriage. You know, marriage is tough. You know, sometimes it's difficult to live lives as, as two imperfect people together. And you got to work at it. And pastors and deacons are to be examples of working at it and morally pure, especially in their marital relationships. They are to be faithful. We'll not take the time this morning, but we could turn to Ephesians chapter 5 and, and there discover the responsibilities of, of husbands and, and, and wives. Well, it's critical, especially in leadership. The last area is that leaders are to be examples. Examples in home and, and in the community. 
And the text reminds us that they are to be thought of well by outsiders. And they are to manage their homes well. Why is that so necessary? It's necessary because leaders need to show people how to get it right. Again, not perfection. Not that there aren't challenges and difficulties. But as examples to the flock. Later on, Paul is going to tell Timothy, Timothy, be an example in word, in conduct. In faith, in in, be an example to the flock. Show the flock how to get it right. You know, life is tough. I mean, pre-COVID, it was tough, right? And now I, I pray for our moms that have young kids at home that are trying to do virtual learning. I mean, you talk you talk about tough. I pray for dads that come home to moms who are trying to deal with children that are trying to do virtual learning. (laughs) And and pastors and deacons, even when it's tough, have to be an example about how, how to deal with that, how to get it right, how to work through the issues of of life. And they need to be examples. Not only in their home, but in the community. Why? Because if a man doesn't know how to manage his own house, how's he going to take care of the church of God? And so as we look at these offices given to us, which identify the operation of the church, it's important to recognize the truth that God has given to us about qualifications. Now this morning I want to bounce from that a little bit. Because I think it's important for us to identify the function of pastors and and deacons. And the function of pastor and deacon is not that they're just movers and shakers. It's not that they're long-tenured people within the church. It's not that they're directors and, and dictators. It's not that they're loud and proud folks. But the function of leadership of the church is that they are a servant. Underline that, will you please? Pastors, deacons are to serve the flock of God. The Bible says this came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Now, I want to identify this function out of two passages of Scripture. First of all, I want to identify the function of pastors as servants, shepherds as servants. Now, we could go to John chapter 10, and we would have the illustration of the good shepherd who gives his life for the sheep. We could even go to Psalm 23, where we discover the Lord is my shepherd, I shall know not, and how he ministers to the sheep. But I want to go to 1 Peter chapter 5, and I have it up here on the screen. And I I want you to see what God says about shepherds being servants. Let me read it for you. So I exhort the elders among you, as a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight. Now let me stop right there. There are three titles that are identified in the text. Did you see the first one in the first verse? Elder. In these verses we have shepherd and exercising oversight. That's bishop. That's pastor and bishop. So this and Acts chapter 20 are the two texts in New Testament Scripture that give to us the three identifies of the pastoral office. Shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion that should be, but willingly as God would have you, not for shameful game, but eagerly, not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples of the flock. 
The shepherd is to be a servant. He is serving the flock of God. He's not to be put up on a pedestal. He's not identified as the key spiritual guy in the church. He's identified as a servant who serves the flock of God. Please, please keep that in mind. Pastors are servants. I also want to identify deacons as servants. The Greek word that is translated in your text, deacon, is diakonos. Deacon, right? And it's used some 30 times in, in Scripture. It's used, first of all, to identify servants. Nine times it, it identifies servants. It also is identified as minister. Nineteen times in the text, you will find it translated as minister. Twice, it identifies individual people. Once in Philippians chapter 1 and then here in our text. Deacons are servants. Now let me very quickly take you to Acts chapter 6. Acts chapter 6 is where we discover that there are men who are chosen to help the apostles in the work of the ministry. And I would identify them as, as deacons. And you're familiar with the text. There was a challenge within the body of believers. The widows were neglected in their daily menstruation. And there was some complaining going on. Now, I know that would never happen in a Baptist church, much less Calvary Baptist Church. There is never any grumbling or mumbling or complaining in this local assembly of believers. But there was in that one. And it was early on in the church's history, so you can kind of understand and the apostles went to the congregation and said this. And the twelve summoned the full number of the disciples and said, It is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the spirit and of wisdom, who we may appoint to this duty. But we will devoid, devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. The apostles said, Guys, we need some help. We're getting pulled away from the ministry of the word, from prayer, and that needs to be our primary function. So we need some help. Choose seven guys who will help us with the ministry, who will fulfill the needs of the congregation, who will minister in, in ways that, that we just don't have time to, to minister. And so they identified seven men who came alongside the apostles and they worked together to help the body be the kind of body that God wanted it to be. Isn't that neat? And so they served. Deacons are servants. Ministers. Those called alongside. Now, I want you to know that I so appreciate our deacons. Our deacons who come alongside Pastor John and me and, and help us in the work of the ministry. Our deacons who fulfill so many tasks to allow us to, to concentrate on what God has called us to do. Now, in our culture, there is a, sometimes a blending of that. And sometimes there are administrative duties that Pastor John and I pro perform to help the church along and to make it function well. But our deacons care and our deacons share and our deacons pray and our deacons encourage and our deacons give insight and, and direction because they are servants. And that is what God has called them to do. Now this morning, I want to identify some qualities of a servant. And I trust that 
you will be able to see these qualities evidenced not only in your pastors, but also in your deacons, in our deacons as we share together. The first quality is that they live out their salvation. You know, it's all about the gospel. It's all about being a new creature in Christ Jesus. It's all about understanding that our salvation is not something that we put on and take off. But our salvation is something that is lived out 24-7, 365, because we are the people of God. That's what a servant does. He lives out his relationship with God. Whether it's in-house or out-of-house. I hope you heard me say out-of-house. Wherever we are, we are the people of God and it's because we've been saved. I thought I might get an amen out of that, but anyway. A servant must be willing to live out their salvation in such a way that it affects those who are around them as light and salt. Not only do they live out their salvation, but they engage people. A servant engages people. I mean, isn't that what service is all about? I am part of an organization called Rotary. It's a businessman's organization that is literally worldwide. And Rotary has a motto, and it's this, service above self. Engaging people to minister to them and share with them. You know, that's just exactly what Jesus did. May I remind you of John chapter 4 where he went and ministered to the woman at the well and engaged her? May I remind you of the times that he came across those who have had needs, whether it was sickness needs or, or, or whether it was physical needs? You remember when he engaged the crowd with the little boy's lunch? Remember when he taught as one having authority, engaging people in their lives. And he did that because he didn't teach like the scribes or Pharisees. He taught differently, relating to people and helping them to establish a proper relationship with God. That's what happens when you serve. A servant engages people. The great commission and the great commandment, right? Great commission, go into all the world and preach to God. That's engaging people. The great commandment. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. That's engaging people. A servant engages people. A servant is also relevant. I love our mission statement that tells us that we are to be passionate about our God obedient to his word, dependent upon him in prayer, connected to one another, and authentic and relevant in this world. You know, there's a lot of noise going on in this world. Have you heard it? I mean, it blocks out almost common sense. (laughs) You know, common sense isn't quite so common in this world anymore. (laughs) But you and I, have a relevant message that we can give to our culture. Think about it. People who are afraid. Do you know anybody who's afraid in this culture? We have the message, fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. You know that? Are people confused in this culture? Have you determined which political ads are accurate and which ones are not? I don't care what they say at the bottom in that small print that you can't read. People are confused today. But you and I are not confused because God is in control and we can trust him for all things. That's a relevant message. And a servant can be relevant. They can rise above all of the noise. 
They can shift through all of the difficulties and get to the heart of the problem. Jesus did that in the lives of a rich young ruler who came to him at night and said, Good master, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus started talking to him about the commandments. Rich young ruler said, I kept all of those. Jesus said, okay, go sell what you have, give it to the poor, and come follow me. Boy, he sifted right through it, didn't he? He cut through the noise. And the rich young ruler went away because he had many riches. A servant has to be willing to perform a variety of tasks. I, I wish that my job description did not include all other assigned duties. Now, don't feel too bad for me because yours does too. Don't you moms out there wish you had a job description that you could stick to and that was the end of it? Don't you dads out there wish that you had some kind of list that after you checked all the boxes, you were done? Don't you husbands out there wish that it was clearly identified, you do this, this, and this, and then the result will be this, this, and this. Life doesn't work that way. There's always something that comes up. And a servant recognizes that if you see a need, you meet a need. And that is evidenced in a variety of tasks that a servant must perform. A servant is authentic. Now, that is different than relevant. Because a servant's real. No plastic banana for a servant. A servant must be authentic and real because if we are not serving with authenticity, then people are going to see right through us. And it really will not impact lives. You ever run into somebody who's not genuine? <laughs> what do you think? You're going to listen to them? You're going to follow them? You're going to allow them to influence your life? A servant must be authentic. A servant, and here's my acrostic, all right, knows what to do. Not that they have all the answers but they at least know the direction to go. They recognize that needs cannot be met. You know, there's a, there's a real difference between listening and acting. I can listen all day long, but, but if I don't do anything with it, if I don't help someone to gain direction in their lives, it, it's not much of a service to them. Now, there are times that my wife just has to use up her words. I get that. And she really doesn't want my input. She just wants me to listen. But after almost 47 years, I've learned what to do. <laughs> Shut up and listen. As my mother would say, God gave you two ears and use them in that proportion. But a servant knows what to do. And lastly, a servant in very special ways is tender-hearted. One of my favorite verses is Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32, where it says, And be kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. You ever go to a doctor that does not have a good bedside manner? <laughs> now, sometimes you have to do that. But I want a servant that has a good bedside manner. I want a servant who is going to be tender-hearted and understand that they just need to be gentle and share in my life. That's a servant. And God has called pastors God has called deacons 
to be servants.